Journey, your television passport to the exciting, colorful world of adventure, as seen through the eyes of real people. Here to present the actual films of tonight's journey is John Stevenson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we welcome from South America, Mr. Eric Pavel, who was born and raised in Brazil. Together with his charming wife, Mr. Pavel sets out to find and photograph two of the major Indian tribes of the Northern Andes. The Pavels make friends with the supposedly notorious Hivero headhunters, and they're also made welcome by the rapidly vanishing Indians known as the Colorados, who incidentally derive their name from the Spanish word for the color red, the color with which they paint their bodies from head to toe. It's Indians of the Andes, and we'll meet our guest on the campus of UCLA in just a moment. And here in this academic setting is Mr. Eric Pavel from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And we welcome to this program with a great deal of pleasure. How are you, Mr. Pavel? Hello, John. You know, it's a long way from Sao Paulo to Westwood, so I'm naturally prompted to ask, what brings you here, and especially to this campus? My present work is doing research and studies of the primitive tribes of Central and South America, John. Well, Mr. Pavel, what compels you to concentrate so much of your time on these Indians? Well, as you may know, the Indians of South America are the largest group of uh, primitive Indians still left in the world today. And with the advance of the white people, they are compelled to retreat into the jungles and are disappearing at the same time. And if they are not studied and recorded on film within the next generation, there won't be any Indians to be studied anymore. Well, that sounds very interesting. Thank you, Mr. Vival. We'll have more questions for you after we see your very fine film. So now let's begin your journey to meet the Indians of the Andes. Here now, ladies and gentlemen, by special film recording is Mr. Eric Pavel to describe his journey to the Indians and the Andes of Ecuador. This, John, is not a natural history museum, but the living room in our home in San Clemente in California. Adorned with all the trophies and souvenirs we have brought back from Latin America from our different trips to the primitive tribes. Some of these are figures, others are masks. That's my wife, of course. This is a little train my little son is playing with. I'm going to take my wife to the western part of South America, to the Andes of Ecuador, which you see on this map. We are going to visit two Indian tribes, each one living on another side of the Andes. First, we drop down towards the west coast. We are going to visit the Indian tribe called Colorados. In order to reach their habitat, their jungle village, we have to leave the Jeep and follow the trail on mule back down the Andes. In the back, you see our mule driver following on foot. I asked him, why don't you ride a mule? He said, who, me? That's much too dangerous. I would <laughs> never do that. I can understand his sentiments. And soon we met our first Indians, a Colorado. Colorado means red, and there is no more appropriate word for these type of Indians because they not only paint their faces red, but they even put red painted clay in their coiffures, in their hairdress, and cut it in a concentric circle, making a sort of a wizard-shaped cap, which is so hard that the rain will drain off. Well, I actually thought that was a cap he was wearing. You mean that's hair? That is hair, which is cut in a circle and pasted with mud. The women do not use this clay in their hair. However, they paint their faces with black lines and black dots. And if you look from far, you have the impression they have a veil in front of their eyes. They also chew the leaf of a plant, which makes their teeth black. And this is supposed to prevent cavities, although it doesn't look too much like a toothpaste smile. Do you mean, Mr. Pavel, that the Colorado woman, when she arises in the morning, uses this as standard makeup? Yes, she will first take a bath in the river, then she'll paint her face, and she'll chew the leaves, and then she'll go down to the daily chores, which are preparing food and taking care of children. And she's ready for her day. The amazing thing is when you see Indian babies, 
they don't look really Indian. Most of the Indian babies have features like the white men, and only when they get to be around five or six do they get the typically Indian features of the high cheekbones and relatively narrow eyes. The children have no toys, so they play with pets. And if they can find a dog, which is not too common in the jungles, then they will have other animals like a little rat, for instance, this girl is playing with. People ask me often, how do you get to Indians in the jungles? Well, you can sit under an elephant's ear leaf, like my wife does here, on a trail, and wait till some Indian gives you a lift. Or else you could reach the Indians the Hollywood way by fighting your way through the jungles, being attacked by jaguars, bitten by a snake, <laughs> uh, covered with mosquitoes until you finally reach some Indian tribe. However, of course, the truth is somewhere in the middle between these two extremes. A horse in the jungle. Is this a pretty common possession of the Indian in the jungle, Mr. Bavell? It depends on the tribe. If they live close to some white settlement, they may be able to get a horse and use it. And the Colorados live very close to a white village, only about 100 miles away, where they got this horse. Now, when you reach an Indian village, you have to bring a lot of gifts. And the Indian will judge your visit by the amount of gifts you have. Then after distributing the gifts to the man and woman, and then giving some toys to the children, you will start studying the way of life. You'll see the woman coming in with a so-called platano. The platano is a banana-like fruit, which they grow because it is their stop of food. One platano can weigh over one pound, and you see the little child here opening one. However, it cannot be eaten raw like a banana. It always has to be cooked. And it is not only the main food of the Indians, they also use it to sell the banana flour to the white traders by drying these platanos. The soup they are preparing here on the open fire will be boiling all day long because the Colorado Indians have no regular meal hours. Whenever some Indian is hungry, he'll go down and help himself to a bowl of soup. The men are working in the sugar plantations. However, this is not an industry for them. It's just for their own use to make sugar and mainly to make an alcoholic drink. They prepare this in a very primitive sugar press, maybe a model which dates back to the 16th century, used by the early Spanish and Portuguese. It consists of two hardwood logs, and the women are feeding the sugar cane between these logs while the men are turning them. The children have no candy, they chew the sugar cane, while the men prepare an alcoholic drink which is also served to visitors. And I myself was offered some and I was told I shouldn't take more than one sip. Then I was supposed to hand it to my neighbor, he will take a sip. Then he will hand it back to me and I will take a sip. And I'll hand it to my neighbor and that will go on until you have no idea how many neighbors you have anymore <laughs> after a while. Well, you seem to enjoy, was that part of the act? It's supposed to be. <laughs> the red paste which they use on their bodies and face and hair comes from the so-called achote seed. And they plant these achotes around their villages. When he needs fresh makeup, he'll pick some of the achote fruit. And inside we find the seeds, which when pressed between the fingers, like my wife is showing here, give that red dye, which mixed with clay, will be used in their makeup their hairdo, or to paint their bodies, which is not only to make them better looking, but also to protect them from mosquito bites. The Colorados use the marimba to make music, and we made an original recording here, and you may have a chance to listen to a few notes while they play. After a while, dancing will start, the older people are a little bit shy at the beginning, and therefore the children start to dance. In the meantime, the man and woman are having some of that alcoholic drink, and it will get into their system, and soon they will start dancing too. And when the older people start dancing, that will not be a dance which will last for a few minutes or a few hours. It may go on a whole night or even two or three days. These people, Mr. Pavel, seem like a very hardy race. Is this true? They live in the jungles. They have to work for a living. They have to catch animals. When it rains, 
They have no other protection except a large palm leaf or a leaf of the elephant's ear. So they have to be hardy in order to survive. Well, that's a very sensible answer. Thank you. Leaving the Colorados in order to visit another tribe, which are the head-hunting Heveros, we have to cross the Andes. We have to cross passes leading up to 11,000 feet. And then down again on the other side of the Andes, where this perpetual snow will melt and flow down into the mighty Amazon river system. Here, the rivers flow in a precipitous flight down the mountainside because within less than 30 miles, they will drop. 10,000 feet. Here there are very few roads. And there's only one road in Ecuador leading to the Amazon jungle, a road down along the Pastaza River. However, this road is open only very few weeks every year. Whenever a hard rain hits this place, the road will be completely covered with mud and the tractor has to open it again. Like we see the Jeep crossing here through a big washout. Any four-wheeled vehicle certainly takes a beating on this trip, doesn't it? They do, but it's the only way to get to these places unless we want to go on mule back, which we will have to do when we come to a place like this where a bridge is broken down. And here again, we take our mules crossing primitive bridges down towards the Amazon River system. Once we have left the Andes behind, the rivers will become more peaceful, and from here on, we will be able to continue our journey on canoes. The army controls the Indian country in Ecuador, and it is not possible to travel here without the permission of the army. They will also supply you with the necessary canoes and guides. And after my wife and I said goodbye to the officers, and they wished us a good trip down the river to visit the Hivero Indians, some 200 miles below this last outpost of civilization. After leaving the last outpost of white man's civilization, we hit the first rapids. And you really have to know your river in order to shoot these rapids with a wooden canoe. And of course, these soldiers are Indians themselves, Indians that have been baptized by the missionaries and then went into the army. And they're used as pilots. Whenever you hit a rapid, they will tell you that there may be only about a foot or two feet of space between the rocks where your canoe can get through. Suddenly, you will find yourself in the midst of the jungle. If you fly over this territory, you'll have the impression that this is just a big green mossy carpet. The river occasionally crosses, cuts through the jungle, winding itself towards the Amazon River. And you have the feeling there is no life down there until you leave your airplane and travel into the jungles, where you find small animals like the termites. And here we have cut open a termite hill and we see the white eggs in the center we also see the two different kinds of termites. The smaller brown ones are the worker termites, and the larger white ones are soldiers. The soldiers never leave the termite hill. Their job is to protect the queen. The queen we see here that is almost two inch long and has to be fed because she never leaves the termite hill. My wife is playing here with a toucan bird. The toucan being characterized by its large beak, sometimes as long as the bird itself. A less pleasant animal found in the jungles is a centipede. We were able to photograph the fight between the centipede and the little white mouse. The centipede may not have a hundred legs, as its name implies, but it has quite a few, and it also has a poisonous sting. And once the little mouse is struck by that poisonous sting, it will die within a few seconds. There are also small kinkajous here, which look like a bear. They make wonderful pets, and my wife adopted the small kinkajou, and we took it along on part of our trip. All you have to do is give him a few bananas every day, and he'll be perfectly happy and stay with you. Here he is taking dinner on his back. <laughs> well, relaxing. It's very hot. Everybody takes a siesta after lunch. So does this little monkey. They 
monkey, which is called barigudo, or large tummy monkey, because of its odd shape. We also find the huge Amazon porpoise. It can live 500 years and weigh up to one ton. Its real size can only be appreciated if we see it close to something we know, like this 11-year-old boy riding this Amazon purpose. However, they are not only animals and birds in the jungles, we also find people living here. And the most interesting tribes in this part of the world are the headhunting heroes. Oh, wait a minute, did you say headhunter Indians? I said headhunter Indians because the Heveros are known not only for their headhunting practices, but they are the original head shrinkers that would take the enemy's head and shrink it to the size of a baseball. This in recent years has been outlawed and the army is looking after it that it's enforced. The government is punishing very severely any killing. However, there is little change in the life of the Heveros today except for the headhunting practice which has disappeared. Here. Well, I'm happy to hear you say that, Mr. Pavel. Whenever a uh, hero visits another tribe, he will stand in front of his host and greet him. A greeting that may last for as long as half an hour. The host will sit, the visitor will tell about his trips, about the rivers he has crossed, the jungles he has passed, and everything that has happened to him, the reason for his visit, how long he wants to stay, and so on. While this very long introduction goes on, we will follow the woman out to the plantation which the Hebrews have around their houses, a plantation of yucca or manioc, a potato-like root which you know in this country under the name of tapioca. They will grow these roots around their homes, and whenever the soil is exhausted, they will have to leave their homes and build a new one a few miles further away. They cut this manioc and make a soup out of it. After peeling the manioc, they will fill large earthen jars, and they will boil for several hours. Here is our visitor still talking to the host, telling him about the wonderful trip. And we made a recording of the two heroes talking, which we are playing now for you to listen. While they are talking, the women have finished peeling the manioc, have covered it with banana leaves, they have gone down to the river and taken a bath. The men are repainting their faces using small bamboo sticks and the same red achote dye we have seen used by the Colorados. And of course, they also keep their children clean. The typically hero way using a live faucet. <laughs> well, of course, is there any other way? Well, water is water after all, and after the child has been thoroughly washed, it will be handed over to his father. Whether he's a hebero or whatever, he still doesn't like water or a bath, does he? <laughs> he certainly doesn't, and he doesn't like to be painted either. However, already at five or six years, he has to be painted with the tribal marks. Oh, by the way, here are our visitor and host again. They are still telling about his wonderful trip, the many rivers he has crossed. Of course, this is not just plain talking. The idea behind it is that the host wants to know his visitor, know a little bit about his background before he asks him into the house. The manioc has boiled now for about half an hour and has become soft. A paste will be made out of it with these wooden poles, mashing it like mashed potatoes. The Indians have wild chicken. However, this would not be enough for their daily food, so they still have to go out and hunt Doing this with blowgun and arrows, this young Indian is preparing, splitting bamboo, cutting it to lengths of about 10 inches, then making one end pointed. The other end will be wrapped with the silk of the silkwood tree. This will give the pressure which is needed when introduced into the blowgun. The other end will then be cut and dipped into curare poison. The cut is necessary because whenever a monkey is hit, for instance, he will try to pull the dart out of his body. But the tip with the poison will stay in, the poison will soon paralyze the monkey, and he will fall down the tree and be picked up by the Indians. He certainly handles this arrow, this dart, uh, very deftly. They are preparing hundreds of them, and of course they play around all day long to train. 
because once he is out in the jungle, he has to use it. He may kill a small bird at a distance of over 100 feet. They use spears, however, in order to kill larger animals like wild pigs or ocelot. Our greeting in the meantime is over. The women have come along and served chicha. Chicha is an alcoholic drink prepared by the same yucca which was boiled before, and the first drink is served to the host. Is there any reason for her running her hand or fingers through this drink, Mr. Bavel? Yes, because she has no thief, so she has to make sure that no solid yucca has been left, and she will do that by running her fingers through and picking out I any see. solid parts. In lieu of a sieve, she uses her fingers. Mm, exactly. And then, after the host has shown that there is no poison, that the visitor can drink it safely, he will be served some chicha. The houses of the heroes have two entrances. One is exclusively used by the man, the other is only for the woman. And when they get together, it might be to reenact the dance, which was danced around a shrunken head. This head, where I was told, is over 30 years old. Is this some relative or an enemy? It was an enemy of the tribe which was killed before killing was prohibited, and the chief has kept his head. Head shrinking has disappeared in recent years. However, all the world has been shocked some time ago when we heard of the five American missionaries being killed by the Aucas in Ecuador, a tribe that lives only 50 miles away from this particular place which we see in this film. I've been often asked since, what is the reason for this killing? How come that after weeks of friendly relations, suddenly the Indians turn to kill the white man? Well, a reason probably lies in the medicine man. The Indians soon find out that penicillin and other drugs work much better than whatever the medicine man will brew up. And so we find that the medicine man is a real enemy of the white people and of the missionaries. And if something has happened in the Indian tribe while the missionaries were there, probably the medicine man blamed it on the missionaries and told the Indians you have to go and kill the missionaries in order to get peace again in your tribe. The heroes will dance around his head for many hours. It's time for us to go, John, leaving these Indians and this small South American nation, Ecuador, against the background of the mighty Andes. Well, thank you, Mr. Bavel. I can understand your concern for these Indians. Life for them must be pretty grim. I noticed that you got into the same headhunter Indian country as those five missionaries who met such a tragic fate. Did you happen by any chance to know these men? Not only did we know them, John, but we actually traveled with them. They helped us reach these Indian tribes you saw in the film, and the plane and pilot which took us there were the same that were killed by the Alka Indians a few months later. Well, that's very interesting. Do you think, sir, that the Alkas will ever become pacified? I am very sure of it, because the missionaries, wherever they have started to do some work pacifying Indians or other primitive tribes, they have always succeeded in the end, and the setback they have had last year will probably not stop them to do their wonderful work. Well, I see. It's interesting to notice that your wife also accompanies you into your, with your trips into the jungle, and she isn't here today to speak for herself. Could you tell us a little about her, please? Well, my wife is a French girl, and uh, strange enough, we met in uh, Uruguay. And what is even more strange, my son was born right here in Burbank. Well, it sounds like an international romance and an international family. Will you, Pavel, stick to the Indians, or do you have plans to visit other countries? Well, we certainly have. We are finishing our work with the Indian this year, and we hope to go to the 7,000 islands of the Philippines next year, studying the primitive uh, people there. 7,000 islands? Yes, over 7,000 islands. You have your work cut out for you, Mr. Pavel. Thank you so very much. We're grateful to you for your appearance in our program. We hope you get to a good number of those Philippine islands. Goodbye and good luck, sir. Thank you, John. It was a pleasure.
From the brilliant pen of the immortal Edgar Rice Burroughs came the legendary king of the African jungle, Tarzan, to thrill all the generations of our time throughout the world. Now the fascinating behind-the-scenes story of making the newest Tarzan movie in Africa. It's the journey to the dark continent by Mr. Mickey Carter to photograph the cartoon king in his own land. Tarzan comes to life in the person of the handsome young actor, Mr. Gordon Scott, who braves the danger of riding the back of a live rhinoceros. Mr. Carter safaris in to find exotic happenings we only read about. A sacrificial ritual is reenacted for his cameras. And he sees that scourge of Africa fire on the veldt. That's next week in Cartoon King in Africa. Until next week, then, John Stevenson saying thank you and good night.